Okay, so we're going to be talking about network, networking devices that are important for LAN, WAN, and MAN environments and providing network services and protocols. Devices such as repeaters, bridges, and routers, and switches, and so on and so forth, in order to provide these, ex these services. So first we're going to talk about repeaters. They act like boosters and conditioners for electrical signals. Signals become weaker the further they travel out, so we've got to make sure we uh, take care of that by amplifying it and correcting those electrical signals. Uh, and those electrical signals could be digital or analog, and it's much easier to correct digital than it is analog, because it's much noisier. Hubs, they broadcast signals to all, so they, uh, they act like a repeater, but they simply broadcast signals to all the devices on the network. Bridges are like a repeater as well, but they offer more intelligent forwarding of data links, uh, data link frames to designated LAN segments. Uh, we have three types, like local, remote, and translation, and they act like a database. So if a request comes in to new computer, from a new computer, it broadcasts the query, receives a reply from the designated device, records the info, sends it back to the new computer, and then it's all based on a MAC address. Spanning tree algorithm takes care of that. Uh, routers. Uh, routers work on the, uh, the layer 3, uh, or IP layer of the OSI model. Uh, they handle the IP or network layer. Uh, they use a routing table for data packets. They use access control lists, and they use these, diff these different protocols like RIP, BGP, and OSPF in order to make sure that it, it sends it to the right path. Uh, so again, it's like bridges, but it's based off IP addresses. Uh, <clears throat> so we just need to keep in mind that a default route, which is in the router, can occur if an unknown destination address is present, if it's configured right. So. Okay, so we have switches. They act like bridges, but they also act like a multi-port device. Uh, they provide end-to-end -end private links. So basically, they send a frame directly to devices based on MAC addresses instead of just sending to other network segments like bridges. They have dedicated bandwidth. They offer VLANs. VLANs are group logical networks. They're used to improve security, scalability, and network performance, reducing traffic congestion and collisions. We also have gateways. They run on software. They're used to translate different formats, such as Ethernet and token. We also have email gateways. Also a good example, since we have different email formats, the email gateways will consolidate everything and turn it into something that we can understand. Uh, private branch exchanges are usually on-premises, uh, providing telephone service for companies. Uh, we have to make sure that we secure these PBX environments because uh, we often overlook them. Uh, we have attackers and hackers like Freakers that basically and, uh, try to guess the default passwords. They get free service and they alter the voicemail, so we've got to make sure that we take care of that as well. The network diagrams that are also in place within a company, uh, we've got to make sure that we also have multiple diagrams of these uh, maps because we have, to have, we have to have a holistic view of the entire infrastructure and we have to understand how it works. Otherwise, we will be guessing as to what security policies need to be put in place. Okay, so let's talk about firewalls. Firewalls are a concept that filter based on rules. Uh, it's basically for incoming and outgoing communications. Uh, they can sit on the network or on the host, and they can be inserted into hardware or software. By nature, they create a demilitarized zone, or DMZ. They act as a zone between untrusted networks and restricted networks. Uh, you really need about two firewalls so that you have one facing the internet and one facing the internal network itself. Uh, they take care, th rather, DMZ has web, email, and DNS servers, and the idea is that if a trusted network, or each, a trusted network will, be, will still be safe if the DMZ is compromised, and so it basically acts as the buffer to, uh, to protect the internal network in case the attacker does compromise those servers. Okay, so all we have here is a firewall DMZ diagram, and this is just showing you the, uh, the layout of the internal and external firewall, which by nature will give you the DMZ network in between, um, so the idea again is if anything that's coming in the internet, it's going inside, it's going to only affect the DMZ, at least that's the idea. Uh, if it does compromise it, uh, at least the internal network will not be affected. So very briefly, we're going to be taking a look at packet filtering firewall as far as stateless and stateful. Stateless uh, is basically filtering based on the headers, not the connection. It's scalable, it is application dependent, and it does offer high performance. So if you're worried about bottlenecks or delays, this is something you need to go with. Stateful is connection based. It will take take a look at not only the not only the headers, but it'll take a look at the content as well. It operates on layer four of the OSI model, but it also looks at layer three and seven. And it is prone to DOS attacks because uh, we have attackers that rely on the flags and sequence numbers, and it will abuse those uh, parameters in order to trick the stateful firewall into thinking that it's actually some good connection or bad connection, or it confuses it and it tries to uh, cause a DOS attack. OK, 
Okay, let's take a look at the proxy firewall. The proxy firewall acts as a surrogate for any requests originated from the outside network. It cuts connection and makes a new connection on behalf of the originator. It hides the internal network details, so if an attacker does come in, then the inside network will still be safe because it won't show any details. We also have dynamic packet filtering, which is a stateful packet inspection. It uses an access control list to manage connections based on traffic's information. Uh, it can dynamically modify the ACL, so for example, if a UDB connection is coming through but it doesn't tell it went to end because it is connectionless, it will dynamically delete it based on a certain time period. Kernel proxy firewalls, that's fifth generation firewalls, that's something that we're using now. It looks at all the layers of the network stack using virtual network stacks with specific protocol proxies for inspection. It's faster and better performance, uh, so this is something that we're using now. All right, so up next is the virtual firewalls. Virtual firewalls monitor virtual machines. They're basically containers within a virtualized environment. They have their own resources. They have their own operating system. So we need to make sure that we have a firewall, a virtual vi a firewall that is monitoring each and every container. Important info on firewalls. Uh, we need to make sure that we deny unknown sources because we want to make sure that uh, we deal with these unknown sources accordingly and deny them. Uh, spoofing. We want to make sure that we take care of that as well. We want to detect any kind of spoofed IP address or any other information in that data packet. Also prevent zombies from coming in or zombie connections. Uh, that's basically DDoS attacks that can affect uh, a whole mass of machines. Uh, we want to reassemble these fragmented packets as they come through to the firewall because we don't want to make a decision before because then that might be doing something bad as well. Overhead must decide uh, if overhead is acceptable because if it is then it's going to create some bottlenecks and might create a little delay but if, if that's important then you might want to actually slim down or streamline your process on the firewall. Make sure you configure new firewalls don't use the default values because of course hackers will exploit that. Proxy servers similar to a proxy firewall except that there is no inspection on packets it serves, the, it serves to cache data to the requester and uh, it pretty much provides confidentiality. For, uh, there's uh, web, reverse, and open proxy servers. And it's used by attackers for sniffing and concealing if it's uh, used for bad purposes. So that can happen too. So we need to be aware of that. Okay, in this last slide, we're just going to talk about honeypots and unified threat management. Honeypots are used to lure attackers. And that's all it is. It's just basically to get uh, to create an emulated process and service environment in this uh, honeypot. And what we're trying to do is create a red herring a decoy. That way we can attract the attackers from coming in and they can hack it. We're doing that because we want to gather information from them, intelligence, and learn from their ways. That way we can uh, prevent future attacks from happening and harden that system accordingly. <clears throat> We want to make sure it's separate from the live network, however, because if we don't do that and they happen to attack the honeypot and compromise it, they will move to the next target and they can do it very easily and very efficiently. Unified threat management, well, that's basically all you can need. It's just an all-in-one system. It combines all the different elements of the security devices into one package. It's great for smooth installation and maintenance. However, it will provide a single point of failure and compromise, so it might be a good idea if you... Uh, want to prevent that from happening you buy another device but if you don't have that many resources or your bandwidth is limited might not be a good idea to even get one in the first place so something to think about so in summary uh, we just want to make sure of a couple of things must you have to make sure you have a security strategy for each device because each device has its own role there's pros and cons to each device so try to understand what you're trying to accomplish which with each device that you have in place uh, make sure you take security measures, uh, meaning that you're going to change the default values, passwords, and decide whether you want a dual-based firewall or just a single-based firewall, right? So that's all dependent upon the security policy of the company, but that is something you need to take care of. Performance versus accuracy, make sure you decide whether you're going to have a, a stateless firewall here or a stateful firewall there, because performance does matter, but we also want to make sure there's accuracy as well as capturing uh, the bad guys, right? The bad, the bad stuff that's coming in or out. Choose the right firewall, meaning that don't put a firewall for the application layer and then you know put it in a network layer. Uh, so that's not going to mix. You want to make sure you you put you put the you put the right firewall in place because uh, there's different kind of firewalls, right? And ensure that unknown sources are dealt with accordingly and swiftly because they can present damage uh, at a moment's notice. So that's definitely something you want to take care of. And consider UTM and honeypots two great things to have. UTM, as I said, it's all you can eat. 
but it does come with a cost. It's uh, it's bandwidth intensive. Uh, honey pots also you want to make sure you do that right because if you open it to the live network, then both of those things will kick will get compromised. That's all I have, and I will see you next week.